aircraft, for the most part, are operational, okay? I say for the most part. Uh, the C-46 over there in the corner, over yonder, doesn't fly, but it still tells the story. Our neighbor's B-25 flies, our neighbor being the American Aeronautical Foundation, okay? And that's also their C-47 over there. Okay, all of our birds are outside today. Now this is a this is an operational museum. In other words, these birds fly. We keep them flying for as long as we can, okay? And it's not cheap, especially when you figure that the average gasoline usage on the average aircraft, for example, the PBJ, 65 to 75 gallons of fuel per hour. That would be the same on the Mustang. The Zero is a little bit cheaper, maybe 50 gallons per hour. Our uh, SNJ may be 40 gallons per hour, but you get the picture, okay? Just in that itself is quite an expense. Now we're not even talking about upkeep. All of the people that work on these aircraft are all volunteer, okay? And we're really passionate about the aircraft. But it's a piece of history. Okay. Because when I come back out of this, uh, the C-46, we're going to talk about this airplane and the big blue one over there. Don't say it over China doll. Oh wow! Why is this is called China doll because it represents the type of aircraft that flew the hump. Anybody know what the hump is? Uh -uh. Let's go inside and find out. Keep your head down. Wow. Go ahead and have a seat over here. Oh, yeah. Come sit. Have a seat. Oh. Everybody have a seat. And you don't have to buckle in. Pretend like it's a 56 Chevy. No seat belts. Okay, now. The hump. The hump is going from India to China or Burma over the Himalayas. Why did we do that? Because the Chinese, at the time, were our good ally, okay, and they really needed our help. Why? Because all the roads in China and Burma were controlled by the Japanese, okay? A lot of the waterways were controlled by the Japanese. So, they needed our help and this is what we did. Flying the hump. You're going from India to China or Burma over the Himalayas. That's why they call it going over the hump, the Himalayas. 25 to 29,000 feet elevation. Ceiling of this area. Oh, wow. Depending on what book you read or what source you go to, this is one of only four flyable zeros in the world, and it is a real Japanese zero. Okay? Now, as I stated before, the Japanese had to get rid of all of their fighter aircraft in Japan. Okay? So, where did this one come from? In the mid-1980s, they found five Z complete zeros in New Guinea, which is just near uh, Australia, okay? They shipped those five zeros to, all, of all places, Kiev, which is in Russia, and they, out of those five zeros, they made three. This one, a sister airplane that was here for a while, and then a third one that's elsewhere. Yes. But this one... And it's arch enemy over there, the Hellcat are my favorites, okay? Pickup truck, sports car, 9,240 pounds empty, 4,000 pounds empty, which made this aircraft of World War II. Now, it was put together in Kiev, okay? Why? I have no idea. The price was right, etc., etc. But it is a true Japanese zero. It's an A6M3. It's the mark that came right after the ones that attacked Pearl Harbor, which were the A6M2, okay? But it's my favorite version of the Zero for a lot of reasons. Number one, it's here, okay? It's a carrier-based aircraft. Look at this, only two feet on each wingtip. Why is that? It's enough to get it down the elevator, okay? Now, the Japanese copied a lot of things, but also they were very inventive. Let me show you over here.
You see this blue color here? Yep. Here and in the wheel wells? That's an early form of anodized treatment for bare metal to protect against salt air. We didn't have it, the Brits didn't have it, but the Japanese did, okay? This is a fantastic piece of equipment. It's a very stable aircraft, it's a landing gear, and I'm pointing this out because when we take a look at the Spitfire, you'll know what I'm talking about. Very stable, it's a landing gear, very I wide. It's mentioned beautiful. Okay. And don't listen to that guy. I mean it. He doesn't know anything about Japanese aircraft. Now, so put together in Kiev, uh, totally Japanese except for two things, okay? This device right here, what do you suppose that's for? Nope. It's above the landing gear, okay? Not necessarily, but when the when it's up, it lets you know that the landing gear is down. When it's down, it lets you know that the landing gear is up. Exactly. And it's Russian. The pitot tube. Do you know what a pitot tube is? It's a speedometer of the aircraft. It's also Russian. Okay. So, the engine is not a Sakai engine. It's a Pratt & Whitney engine. But, gee, I wonder why it fits in there. Probably because they copied the engine for their Japanese Zero and their other aircraft. But this engine was manufactured. Do you know who made the? Do you know who made the Japanese Zero? Anybody? Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. Okay. Most people know that because of their cars. Okay. Well, my dad knows about these because he was on the PT boats in the South Pacific, and he saw a lot of these guys fly over. And he had a special name for that red insignia but I can't do that in mixed company. <laughs> anyway, and he would never buy a Japanese car. That's age appropriate for a World War II vet right, in the right. South Pacific, okay? He's gone, he's been gone since 2004, but he still smiles down at me when I tell this point. Hmm. Mitsubishi, right? The engine was manufactured in 1943 by the Buick Corporation. It's a Pratt & Whitney engine, but built by Buick. So you have a Buick-powered Mitsubishi. Right on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So does my dad. So let's go right on over there. The empty weight of this airplane is 9,240 pounds. Okay? The empty weight of the Zero, less than 4,000 pounds. That's why that was the most maneuverable aircraft of World War II. Anybody that says different, they're wrong. Period. End of report right here. This airplane, the Hellcat, changed the air war in the Pacific by its kill ratio. Do you know what I mean by that? The ability to shoot down more aircraft than, than it was shot down. Right. This, the Hellcat hit a, had a kill ratio of 19 and a half to 1. Okay, It destroyed more than 5,100 Japanese aircraft in the air to a loss of 270 of these. And these were due to ground fire, not ship to ship, okay? And you can tell that I'm an art teacher when we get up to this point right here. It's the only World War II aircraft with a big smile on his face. <laughs> or if you're a Japanese pilot, it's a grimace, yep. okay? But it's a fantastic aircraft. Now, where were the guns really? on that one? I see the gun 20 the millimeter wings. cannons in the wings, mm -hmm. and look over here. You see the, 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 the dent in the top of the hood there, in the, the, the cowling? Yeah. 50 caliber or 30 caliber machine gun that fired oh. through the arc of the propeller. Oh, wow. World War I technology. The Japanese pretty smart. Absolutely. Now, uh, 650 caliber machine guns. Okay. Unlike the Zero. fold up from right here and they fold back up against the fuselage and it looks like a bird sitting on a nest when it's when it's like that okay and it allows for a lot more aircraft on the aircraft carrier okay which is what it's all about not so many with the zero but it could still get below the decks okay and so this is this is the game changer this is the game changer but 
if it had to been for uh, a certain pilot, a Japanese young pilot that crashed in the Aleutian Islands, okay, this would have never had the kill ratio that it had. In June of 19, uh, June 4th of 1942, a Japanese Zero crashed in the Aleutian Islands, killing the young pilot. He was 19 years old. Petty Officer Koga, okay? And a little more than a month later, in July 10th, 1942, the Navy found it, shipped that airplane down to North Island in San Diego, immediately put it in Navy colors. Why do you suppose that is? Anybody? So it wouldn't be shot down. You're on the east, you're on the west coast. You see a Japanese airplane flying over in 1942, you're gonna shoot it down. If you're a kid in school, you're gonna take your uh, <laughs> slingshot out and try to shoot it down. Put it in Navy colors. With the tests that were performed by that pilot, now we knew everything about the Japanese Zero. It was the premium fighter of the Japanese Empire. Fantastic, it didn't get any better than that. Now we knew everything about it. The Navy does not like to pay tribute to its enemies at all. But that was Koga's zero. They paid tribute to that young man that lost his life because that was a game changer. Okay, well, I have a display inside that tells that. But anyway, that's why this is able to do that because of Koga's zero. Period. It's not happenstance. We learn from, from our enemies. Don't take off too much of the exhaust, please. And you know why? I ask these people not to take the exhaust stains off because it, 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 that right there lets you know that it flies. Sure. You leave the exhaust stains on there. I, that's okay. Go ahead. I think there's some more. Ah, that's fine.